Welcome to the Alameda County Pod Operations Training Module for Vaccine Dispensing. As a member of the operations team at a point of dispensing or pod site, you have the central role in making the pod successful. The operations section is the largest section in the pod because it's responsible for carrying out the main pod activity, vaccinations. Most operations jobs involve a good deal of face-to-face -face interaction with the public. The other sections are all working to support your mission. Planning does record keeping and situational analysis using patient and ICS forms after you're done with them. Logistics provides supplies and personnel. And finance keeps an audit trail and collects receipts and injury and damage reports. In a mass vaccination scenario, you might have to inoculate an entire community within 48 hours. This is a time-critical emergency, so speed is essential. Remember, rule number one in a time-critical event is speed equals survival. Other prophylaxis scenarios, like anthrax, may require oral medications, that is, pills. However, in all cases, remember to keep the line moving. Note that using a pod to provide vaccinations instead of pills or other oral medications does not change the nature of pod operations. Staffing, medical oversight, record keeping, and even most supplies and equipment will remain the same. Although your primary mission is vaccination, the public may feel their primary mission is getting information. As a point of contact with the public, you'll be the focus of many questions. There will be a massive public information campaign to assist you. But you should remember that the public is looking at you as a role model. If you display calmness and understanding in the emergency, the public will reflect it. Be prepared to address the most obvious concerns. For instance, the public may question why rush prophylaxis. They might worry about the risks. And they might wonder about effects on pregnancy. Limit your information to what's found on the fact sheets and remember, only the public information officer or designee with Emergency Operations Center clearance should communicate with the media. As part of the emergency response team, you'll be the first to receive prophylactic medical countermeasures. Pod and transportation personnel should be vaccinated prior to beginning vaccination of the public in order to protect against exposure to symptomatic clients. This also allows the staff to give the pod process a dry run. Note that vaccinated pod personnel do not require a waiting period before vaccination activities begin. As long as triage prevents the admission of ill or potentially infectious clients into the pod. The pod has two basic flow tracks, the express track and the assistance track. 95% of people will go through the express track and receive vaccinations normally. The assistance track is only for the small percentage whose health would be threatened without special medical attention or communication. The dispensing process is meant to be fast and simple. Fill out a form. Review it for allergies or complications. Receive your vaccination and turn in your form before exiting. And if you need assistance, there are medical and communication experts available to help. Pod operations can be divided many ways. There are clinical and non-clinical roles. There are express and assistance tracks. And there are stationed staff and roving staff. Let's first review the operations roles for the express track which will process 95% of clients. Initially, there's the arrival area. When the public arrives at a pod, this is the area where they first become our clients and come into contact with pod staff. Arrival extends from the pod entrance all the way into the parking lot. Staff covering the arrival area all the way to fill out forms includes greeters, flow control, information staff, and interpreters. Together, this team is responsible for making sure that the pod gets a steady stream of form-ready clients. Greeters are the first contact with the public. 
Greeter number one is stationed at the very end of the line. The greeter's mission is to form clients into a manageable line, be supportive to those with concerns, and be on the lookout for the severely ill or infirmed. This may involve walking up and down the line asking questions. Is anyone feeling ill? Or was anyone in direct contact with someone who was ill? If you encounter someone who's sick outside the pod, quickly separate them from the rest of the crowd. Don't send them into the pod, but get them to an outside medical team. You might also remind clients that cell phone use should be limited to emergency communications only. Don't overload the cell towers. After the greeters, clients move into the care of flow controllers. The flow control team is responsible for making sure that the line feeds quickly into the pod entrance and that forms are distributed. After flow control, clients move into the care of the information staff. The information team is responsible for making sure that the forms are filled out as fully and accurately as possible. Because the public sees greeters, flow controllers, and information staff as the first professional faces at a pod, your demeanor can have a big impact. If this is a dire emergency, one of your most important responsibilities is to remain a calm and reassuring presence. People may have a lot of questions. If there's time, calmly answer their questions, but only if you're certain you know the answer and it will contribute to the flow. One technique is to keep moving yourself. If you stop to talk, the line stops to listen. Remember that there are printed materials and Q&A staff stationed at the exit to answer any questions that clients still have. Roving staff can be found anywhere in the pod, including arrivals, and may be able to assist you. They include interpreters, mental health workers, chaplains, and runners from the logistics unit. In large pods, clients will have to fill out forms while standing. Forms should be preset on clipboards with plenty of spare pens or pencils. Patient information forms will vary depending on the incident. For an injectable vaccine pod, only those who show up in person can receive treatment. In contrast, for anthrax, one person can pick up medication for others, so those forms allow for multi-person pickup. The patient information form for vaccinations is a sorting tool formatted to quickly separate yes from no answers. One of the primary concerns is allergic reactions to vaccines. This form also identifies children and pregnant women. Forms should address the following. Allergies, adverse events after prior doses of influenza vaccine, or current health status, including any acute illness. For instance, asking persons if they can eat eggs without adverse effects is a good way to screen for egg allergies. Any persons with history of anaphylactic or anaphylactic-like allergy to eggs or egg proteins should generally not receive the common vaccine for influenza. They should be given egg-free vaccine. In general, if there's a yes answer on the patient form, clients should be directed to medical evaluation where they'll receive additional information based on the yes answers they checked. If individuals have all no's on their form, they should be directed to continue on the express track to the vaccine distribution area. As a flow controller, your job is to make sure that clients answer the questions. Don't diagnose them. The most you should offer, if the clinical group supervisor and pod site manager approve, is simple clarification of medications. Success for the fill out forms team means that the standby area at the entry to the next station is always packed with clients holding completed forms. The next area is the show forms area, staffed by the forms reviewers. As a forms reviewer, you stand at the crossroads of the pod. Your mission is to sort clients into express track or assistance track. Remember, the vast majority of clients should go through the express track. Often, 
the show form station becomes the rate limiting step in pod operations. This means the line backs up at show forms and the speed of the pod becomes dictated by this station. Try not to let this happen. The best pods operate with the vaccination station as the rate limiting step. The primary mission, vaccinating clients, should dictate the speed. Each incident will require a customized form. As a reviewer, you'll get a briefing and an instruction sheet for each new form. Forms are typically designed to require follow-up for any yes answer, but sometimes people may be tempted to choose yes answers unnecessarily. So quickly confirm the reason for a yes. If clients have communication, ambulatory or sensory issues, in short, if they cannot communicate or cannot walk the length of the pod, then they should be directed to special needs. Use the assistance track sparingly. Each special case consumes extra time and resources. But use common sense. Not all people in wheelchairs are special needs cases. And just because someone speaks another language doesn't mean that they require translation services. Most clients will have a functional understanding of English that can be supplemented by printed materials in their native languages available at the exit. Some pods may even have multiple language forms, so even Spanish-only clients could answer no to all of the questions and then be safely directed to the vaccination station. The next station, vaccinations, is where the central and most important mission of the pod occurs. The vaccine dispensing unit leader oversees the vaccine dispensing staff who work with the rest of the dispensing team under the direction of the clinical group supervisor. In smaller pods, these roles may be combined. Approved vaccinators can be nurses, physicians, pharmacists, or designated paraprofessionals with medical clearance. Tables should be set up using Alameda County's standard vaccination station layout. Individuals can elect to sit or stand, and infants can be held. Standing is more time efficient, but if clients are at all squeamish or likely to faint, they should be seated. The vaccination area should have the following supplies nearby. Scales to weigh clients. Blood pressure monitoring devices and epinephrine and Benadryl injections in case of an allergic reaction. Vaccination assistants will assist the vaccinators in pre and post vaccination activities, including preparing the vaccine, loading syringes, preparing clients for vaccine, and maintaining adequate supplies. Note that more detailed information on preparing vaccines and loading syringes can be found in the training module in this series, How to Give a Vaccination. But as a reminder, only prepare enough vaccine to meet the station's ongoing needs. Fill syringes at the time of vaccination only, because unused filled syringes must be discarded at the end of the vaccination session. In case of pandemic influenza, nasal vaccine spray may be used. The nasal syringe is placed at the nasal opening. A firm pressure on the plunger sprays medicine into the mucous membrane area inside the nose. A clip stops the plunger at a half dose for one nostril. Remove the clip and spray the rest of the dose into the other nostril. The vaccine works by getting into the mucous membranes, so inhaling is unnecessary and causes a bad medicine taste in the mouth. However, nasal spray isn't recommended for everyone, so some clients will still need injections. You should use caution when handling vaccines. Be sure to disinfect contaminated surfaces. Dispose properly of soiled materials and needles. And don't forget to monitor vaccine storage temperatures. To prevent inadvertent needle stick injuries, Syringes should be discarded immediately after use in labeled, puncture-proof containers. The following guidelines should be observed for appropriate sharps disposal. 
medical waste sharps containers should be available in the area where the sharp is used. All needles should be deposited into a sharps container immediately after use. Sharps containers should be handled carefully and sealed with duct tape after use to avoid spills. Arrangements should be in place for transport and destruction of filled sharps containers. Vaccine cold chain and handling requirements are also very important. Vaccines should be maintained at temperatures between 35 and 46 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 2 to 8 degrees centigrade. Do not freeze them. However, some vaccines, including influenza spray, may arrive frozen. Frozen vaccines should be thawed to enable rapid administration. But once thawed, never refreeze them. Vaccines should be shipped and stored in insulated containers. Styrofoam containers and cold packs are adequate for local transport and day use. If a pod lasts for more than one day, arrangements should be made for close monitoring of vaccine storage. For longer term storage, you must use a refrigeration unit. Storage should be located in close proximity so that temperatures can be regularly monitored. Refrigerators without freezers usually perform better at maintaining temperatures. Vaccines should be stored centrally in the refrigerator, not in the door or on the bottom of the storage unit, and kept away from walls to allow air to circulate. Vaccine refrigerators are designed specifically to accomplish this. The vaccination assistants should make sure to record the vaccine and diluent lot numbers on the consent forms. To keep the express track moving quickly, the assistance track is split off to the side into two service areas, medical evaluation and special needs. At medical evaluation, a clinical healthcare provider is available to make any necessary medical decisions. The clinical group supervisor will typically be a doctor with prescription authority. They oversee the rest of the medical evaluation staff made up of medical consultants with varying levels of clinical expertise. The goal of medical evaluation is to allow every client to exit the pod either with a safe vaccination or appropriate instructions for getting treatment. The clinical group supervisor should conduct a briefing and have a pod medical evaluation reference sheet from the health department. Clients have been referred to medical evaluation because they've answered yes to questions on the patient information screening form. Your job is to finalize the selection and dose of medication for clients who are routed to your station by the screening process. Some medical evaluation cases can be resolved with the client simply returning to the vaccination station to receive inoculation along with the rest of the express track clients. Clients with severe allergy concerns may be given non-egg-based vaccine if available or referred to some place where they can receive treatment. If you are a medical consultant at this station and do not feel comfortable making this decision, please contact the clinical group supervisor for advice. Clients with mobility, communication, or sensory impairment should be sent over to special needs. Sick clients will be evacuated to healthcare facilities, as will any clients with life-threatening emergencies. The final station in the assistance track is the special needs area, a one-stop catch-all for any remaining problems that might disrupt flow. Your mission is to assist clients to complete the patient information form, provide vaccinations, and answer related questions if necessary. Some special needs cases simply need a place to sit and rest because they're too old or infirm to walk the length of the pod. You may consider a dedicated vaccination station just for them. Some special needs cases may need a language interpreter and some may require mental health support. Since special needs is generally considered the home base for most roving pod staff like language interpreters and mental health counselors, they should be easy to find. The last station for either the express track or the assistance track is turn-in forms. The turn-in forms station is a collecting point for all patient information forms, but it also serves as a question and answer station. 
Staffing this station are the forms collector and the Q&A staff. The station itself should be arranged so that forms can easily be collected and printed materials grabbed on the way out. But Q&A should be off to the side or outside the building so that it doesn't impede the exit path. Forms collectors should remember that patient forms are considered confidential and must be kept secure. Once collected, patient forms still have work to do. They need to be collected by the planning section for use in monitoring pot function. Later, patient information should be computerized at a data input station. However, the written records must be maintained. Data entry of patient forms is not recommended during active time-critical pot operations. However, data entry should be performed within a few days of vaccination because disease surveillance and tracking of medications or side effects will be important. If data entry is begun at the pod site, it's recommended that you do it after its use in analysis by the planning section. The last area in the pod the public encounters is the question and answer area. Q&A staff should help draw people out of the pod and must be ready to answer the most common questions. Anything they cannot answer or address by handing out printed material, they should refer to personal physicians or online resources. Examples of questions you might hear at Q&A include, what side effects are possible? The answer, redness, swelling, and slight fever are typical reactions to vaccines and do not normally require additional care. Question, what side effects are serious enough that I should call a doctor? Answer, any side effects that seem unusual or affect your ability to function should be reported to your doctor right away. Tell your doctor what's happening, the date and time it started, and when the vaccination was given to you. Once clients pass Q&A, they're essentially finished with the pod. As a member of the pod operations staff, you're the tip of the spear in emergency mass prophylaxis. Your success can be measured in lives saved. The knowledge you gained here can be adapted to many emergency situations. Even if you're not deployed in a vaccination scenario, you should be better able to integrate your skills for the benefit of others. Thank you for becoming a public health first responder. This pod video training series is brought to you by the Alameda County Public Health Department, Office of Public Health Emergency Preparedness, in collaboration with Applied Creative Training, Inc.